Okay, so my name is Tav. I'm from Israel. I work for Cisco. And um, I'm going to talk today about something very essential, which is how we learn in general. So, This, are, this is me and the boys. <laughs> um, and probably a lot of you are thinking right now that I snuck into this conference because everything here is Java. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is nostalgic to me. I can, I can remember the days when I was like, it's just me and Spring and Kotlin and maybe Jenkins for CI CD. And I thought this was going to go on with me for the enti my entire career. I started planning years ahead, um, becoming a Java professional you know, focusing on Java because I love it so much. You, all of you probably hate me. Um, but this is, a, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea and I'm gonna broaden this, broaden this out um, to our entire lives. This is a romantic myth. This is a romantic story. And I wanna quote one of the, um, one of the best cognitive researchers I know of. His name is John Verveke and he said that romanticism is like spiritual junk food. And by the way, when I say romanticism, I don't mean in like the relationship sense. I mean generally like if may, might, some of you might be familiar with the romantic movement from the 18th century. I won't go any deeper into it, but basically it's, it's, a, it's a point of view that kind of re distorts reality about how things are gonna go, about what we're capable of, about wh what we can focus on. Um, and we really shouldn't imagine that we can marry a language or marry a tool or marry a set of tools and just go in our entire lives with them. So I want to move on to a question. Um, the half-life, if anyone knows what the half-life means, anyone? Wait, actually I have, I said that I'll put on the glasses. The term half-life, anyone familiar with it? Yeah. Sort of, yeah. It's sort of the expiry date of a substance. Basically, how long it takes before half the substance completely disintegrates. Um, and can anyone guess what the average half-life for a developer's knowledge is? By this I mean the average time it takes for half of your knowledge as a developer to completely be irrelevant to the industry. Anyone? Two years and decreasing. That's a, a, a correct answer. <laughs> this is the estimation. Two to three years, half of what you know of will likely be irrelevant. It's not news for everyone, but it's definitely a concern, right? So let's start, try to work out a solution. So what I suggest, just one way to solve this, is you go to the local internet cafe, you fire up your favorite VPN. By the way, this talk is sponsored by Shark VPN. Then you go on to hack any president with uh, nuclear capabilities, and you end the human race once and for all, thus preventing any new JavaScript libraries from ever being published. That's, that's one way. I mean, it's, it's, it's the potentially possible. And another way, a simpler one, is to just embrace that you have to learn your entire life. So these days, adapting to new circumstances might be the most valuable skill anyone can have, let alone a developer, right? But um, it's always been the case, and now it's even, it's even greater. And the reason is that we're going through an AI revolution, and the rate of change is expected to increase dramatically. I mean, so many talks about AI in this conference, some of, some of them about how they're going to take our jobs and all that. Honestly, none of us know if, how true that is. I think that not, not that true, but none of us know, but what's um, definitely going to happen is that changes are going to occur more frequently. So in the next decade, the rate of change is expected to increase drastically. A lot of um, experts say this from philosophy and tech and all, all around the globe. And this is not bad news, I think. Um, not necessarily, at least, because, again, it's always been the case. But you do need the right approach. You do need to deal with a world that's constantly changing, right? So I want to ask you a question about, about us as a, as a race, um, humanity. 
What do you think, obviously it's an opinion, right? But what do you think was the greatest discovery of, the human, of, the, of humanity in the scientific revolution? Anyone wants to, to give their own answer? <laughs> scientific methods. Scientific methods. Oh, obviously, it's, it could be a lot of things. But what, what I want to refer to right now, and I do think that it's the greatest in, in the sense that it's profound and essential and fundamental, is that our own ignorance. We finally, as a, as a humanity, as a human race, could say that we just don't know anything, that we have no idea what's the meaning of this whole thing, and that we have no way of, of getting to know a lot of things, and we have really strict limitations. And this, is, this allows us to move forward, because we finally know we should move forward. We finally, we, we finally know that we should discover, we should um, invest our time in research and in science. So we, we couldn't own up to, to our own limitations. And I want to move forward about telling you a story that's a little bit personal. Um, this is a photo of my parents. And in the center is our dog. His name was Socrates. <laughs> well, he really saved me. He saved me from bullies. And the reason is that my dad really likes philosophy and he wanted to name me Socrates. And my mom <laughs> totally <laughs> helped me dodge that bullet because I was like the, the obvious bully target my entire life. He, my name was Socrates. Tav is strange enough, by the way, in Israel too. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I want to share with you a story about Socrates. Um, and I, I know a lot of you know him. He's a very prominent figure. Honestly, some people say that he never existed. It's, it might be the case because... He has so many myths around him, and he doesn't have to exist for the lessons that he can teach us to be right. So Socrates had this thing that he would go to the marketplace or anywhere, and he would just bombard a lot of people with tons of annoying questions. Like he would go to someone who was quietly shopping in, uh, in the marketplace, and he would say, hey, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm shopping, Socrates. Uh, wh what do you want? Well, wh why did you get here? Why did you get here? Um, Oh, I, don't, I want food, Socrates. I'm, I'm buying some food. Yeah, but why do we need food? Because food is important. I want to live. I want to I wanna eat. It's important to me. Oh, so you mean that you definitely spend your time on what's important? Yes, Socrates, of course. What's important is very important, right? So did you ask yourself how to be a better person today? No, Socrates. I was just, I woke up and I brushed my teeth. So, so you don't necessarily spend your time on what's important. So anyway, he would just bombard people with these questions. It would be really annoying. This is actually a very uh, well-known psychologic method. It's called Socratic questioning. Um, and Socrates wanted people to understand how, um, how much they don't know what they're doing, how much we go, like, we have this uh, auto flight our entire life, and we don't necessarily do what we want to, and we don't necessarily spend our time on what we cherish, right? So I want to show you a myth about Socrates that kind of captures this essence. So back in ancient Greece, we had this city called Delphi, um, and there was an institution called the Oracle of Delphi. There was this kind of um, prophet that would... Um, predict the kind of predict the future. Um, people would go to this prophet, and she would say stuff like, I mean, they would ask her, um, Oracle of Delphi, where, where can I find my one and only? And she would always answer extremely cryptic and annoying answers, stuff like, you should look to the east, and something very incoherent and, and, and unreasonable, usually. Um, so one day, Socrates' disciples uh, went to the Oracle of Delphi, and they asked, they wanted to test her out. So they asked her, um, who is the smartest man alive? Is there anyone smarter than Socrates alive? And then the oracle simply responded, no. There is no one smarter than Socrates. Um, and this is really strange, right? Because she would usually answer in really cryptic ways. And they were bewildered by this answer. And so they, w they went back to Socrates and um, they told him about this news. And he was even more bewildered because he knew he was dumb. <laughs> he knew he was really profoundly um, ir uh, uh, irrational and unlogical, and he had so many flaws that he was aware, aware of. So how could he be this greatest man alive or the smartest man alive? So he wanted to, he wanted to set out and find why the gods are telling him this, uh, giving him this message. Um, by the way, he was kind of a religious person, so he did believe in the gods. Um, so 
So he went out and he talked to some prominent figures in ancient Greece, and he realized that a lot of them, and these are very esteemed people, right? And he realized that a lot of them don't know what they're talking about at all in most subjects in life. And I, I'll, make, I'll make this story shorter. Basically, he came to the realization that the reason that the gods give him this message about being so smart is it's, it's because he's the one who knows the most how stupid he is. He was the only one at that time, or at least the, the, the one that's most aware of his own stupidity and his own limitations. That's Socrates' um, catchphrase, right? Know thyself. He said it a lot. So it's not only about knowing what you don't know. I mean, it's mostly that. But inside knowing what you don't know, the most important thing that you re should realize that you have no idea about is yourself. And to frame it in another way, we're extremely self-deceptive human beings. We have a profound and fundamental and really deep self-deception about our lives. We often have no idea what we're doing. And this, we can see this in a lot of sets of behaviors, right? For example, when we go to the airport and we're so scared of the plane crashing because it's so salient to us, it makes so much sense to us that we would fall out of the sky, we're so afraid of it, but then we would get back home thanking, thanking the world for not killing us, and then we get into a car which it has like a hundred times more chance to, to, to get killed in, right? So this is a very self-deceptive deceptive behavior we have, because logical um, thinking would surmise that you, sh you should be more afraid of getting into a car. Another example is uh, in the internet age, the extreme increase of the confirmation bias. And if you're not familiar with this concept, it's basically that we're very much drawn to learning more about what we already believe. So thing is, we search YouTube for something and we think we're doing research, we think we're, we're trying to challenge ourselves, but we would just search the things that we already believe in. We usually just strengthen our own biases and that's why, by the way, if you guys have seen, we, we get more polarized as a society, right? And arguably the most, um, the biggest self-deception is kind of recursive. And it's the self-deception about the fact that you can overcome your self-deception. Thing is, in my opinion, in a lot of researchers' opinions and a lot of philosophers' opinions, it's just impossible. We'll always have this degree of self-deception in us. That's just the creature we are. So probably I would say, in my opinion, the biggest thing that you should be aware of day to day and in your entire life, that one, one notion that should guide you through everything is that you're always at risk of extreme and fundamental self-deception. So what am I talking about? What does this have to do with anything? So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build an approach a philosophical mindset for learning better, right? Because I should remind you guys, because actually I, I, I talked about so many things right now. We're talking about how we can learn as developers specifically. This is a developer conference. So I think this philosophy has a lot with us. It benefits us in several ways. First one, we just get better collaboration with our peers when we think in this mindset, when we understand our limitations when we know that we're not supposed to know anything. We also get more insights on, into our strengths and weaknesses. We, can, we know what we're good at, we know what we're bad at, and we don't expect ourselves unrealistic things. And a lot of you probably feel this, this imposter syndrome, if you're familiar, this concept of feeling like an imposter in your role, like you walked in through the back door of the industry and the guard is gonna find you any day and kick you out. A lot of us feel this way. I know I feel this way every day. I always feel like I'm incompetent and I don't have enough in me. And knowing how all of us have so much going on in our lives that we have no idea about how much all of us are, are, have so many limitations and so many biases and so many weaknesses, it helps alleviate that. Because we all, we all just want to live right. We all just want to be good to each other, at least most of us. Remembering that, that if we hurt each other, it's not necessarily on purpose, and that um, making a mistake isn't necessarily um, 
making you an imposter. I think that's a really strong belief to start with. So that's enough with philosophy. Um, I want to move to more um, practical stuff, to a little more strategic view on the, on the area of uh, on the topic of learning. So let's look at practical ways to learn better. First subject I want to talk about is called zone of proximal, prox uh, of, uh, proximal development. It has a very complex name, but it's actually a pretty simple uh, idea. So the question you want to ask is, how do you know uh, when you're ready to learn something, right? Because we have so much to learn, especially in the tech world. We have so many things that people tell us, everybody, what, what's this Kubernetes thing? I'm missing out on Kubernetes. It's so, it's, everybody has to know Kubernetes, right? No, but I wa also wanted to learn Python, because py everybody's coding Python. What should I, what should I do? Um, so ask yourself questions like this. Can you program without basic computer skills? I think not. I had a student was uh, once um, in a course that I instructed that came in and he couldn't operate basic windows, right? So no, he couldn't program. He, he fell out of the course very, very easily. And it's not that he can't be a programmer. He just has a ways to go about this. He has to first get the, get the basics, right? Acquire the basics. So ask yourself this. What can I do right now? Um, you can do stuff like um, jumping from programming bootcamp to doing very complex computer graphics, for example. It's just too big of a jump. So this is the zone of uh, this is basically um, a breakdown of of things you can learn and things you already know. In the middle circle, it's your knowledge. It's what you already know, what you're familiar with, what you have like uh, an abstract representation of, and you can just pull it at any time from your long-term memory. And then the inner circle represents what's based on your knowledge already. So you have to basically seek out what you know, and with that, things that are close enough are probably things you can learn. And the outer circle is obviously things that are currently out of reach for you. So like the programming bootcamp to Computer graphics. Computer graphics are out of reach for the bootcamp um, graduate, but they can go through the inner circle, learn some stuff, and then get to um, the out of reach area. Um, I'll give a more concrete example later, and it actually has to do with computer graphics. So, so I know it, it kind of sounds simple, except for the, the the name zone of proximal development. Except for it, for that, it's it sounds pretty simple, right? But Think about it, how we even identify what falls in each circle, because each one of us has different knowledge, each one of us has different things they want to learn. Some of us have interests in that area, and some of us are in that area, so what falls in each circle? Um, so let's look at an example. This is Lucy. She just graduated from a programming bootcamp, and this, the, most, the most prominent skills she acquired are Node.js and JavaScript, which is very common in bootcamps, and MongoDB. And basically, she just started working. And for some reason, her job asked, wanted to move to Golang and use the, data, the Postgres database, which she has no idea about. So I think it's a very good question if you can even really make that leap. I mean, it really depends, right? Because what I mean by this is that this is where Lucy's at, right? This is what she knows. She knows Node.js and Mongo. And Let's try to figure out what's even in the other circles. Um, are Postgres and Go there? I mean, they might be. I know that for, for me, like moving from Java to, um, to Go was really easy. So it was probably in my uh, uh, um, middle circle. But maybe for some people, I, and I encountered some, because JavaScript, for example, is a typed language. Is, isn't, sorry, an, an untyped language. Maybe she has to go through doing something similar first, like learning about TypeScript, which is similar enough. She can learn the types and then move on to Golang, which has a lot of more complex uh, concepts in it. Same with Postgres, right? So she does know how to use a database. So you could say it's just moving from one database to another. But you could also say the concept of tables and, relational, uh, and, and relationships between tables uh, is too complex. So perhaps you should first figure out that before you move on to actually using the database. So it's, I think it's a really good question. And this is only a simple example, but in other cases in life, it's not, it's not as, um, I mean, you have 
much more variables and much more moving parts. So I think it's a question we should really ask ourselves. What's in each of our circles? So next is uh, competence estimation. Basically, how you know how competent you are in an area of your job. So, oh, sorry. How do you even identify your level of expertise? So there's this model called the Dreyfus model, and for anyone who knows Alfred Dreyfus, this is not him. Um, the Dreyfus model was made by um, two brothers in the University of California. Um, and basically, it's described in Wikipedia as a model of skill acquisition, um, of how learners acquire skill through formal instruction and practicing, you, uh, which is used in the fields of education and operations research. So basically, it means it maps and describes level of, of competence. What does it mean? Um, basically, there's this pyramid with uh, usually five steps, but some people add, uh, add another step. It doesn't really matter. You start as a novice, and then you get to a master once you're done learning any subject, completely done. Um, but what identifies each level? How do you measure how good you are at something, if you're a novice or an expert or a proficient or a master? So the question you want to ask yourself is, you want to ask several questions. Um, the first one is, how much do you have to follow strict rules? That's the first one. You can see that novices usually have to, um, adhe to, to adhere to rules very um, concretely. They have very concrete rules about stuff. They, they need things to be clear, that you don't have to think about things too much. You just have to know this is what's the right thing to do and just do it. And an expert would have the skill to transcend this reliance on rules. An expert would be able to think for themselves and understand that multiple ways could solve the situation, but what is most relevant to mine? Yeah, so there are other stuff about it, but I want to give you an example to, um, to, to, to show them. So, for example, if the question that we ask is, which is better, Python, Python or Java? So possible answers you can give are Python. It's better. Another one would be, uh, it depends. And the last one, is this even a question we want to ask right now? Is this relevant? So what do you guys think? Who, um, in terms of the, their level, like junior or senior or ex expert or whatever, would say Python? You can just say it out loud if you, if you don't mind. Who says it's a junior? Oh, okay, I got to put the glasses on, of course. Who says it's the junior that says Python? All right. Who says it's the senior? All right, so I think I, think I would say junior too, but it, I don't think it's that easy to know. And the reason is, um, basically, when you um, go up in the pyramid, you get more focus. You get, you, you're more able to focus on the right things, right? So a novice would probably say Python. I agree with you on that, because most hands were on a junior in Python. Um, I think someone who's proficient, who's like getting there, would, it, it's very likely that he, they would say there is no best language. And that's right, actually. Um, and a master would say something like, I don't know. Is, uh, is it the best for what? I mean, what are we doing? What are we trying to achieve? So I, I, I get this notion in the industry that a lot of people say, like, Language doesn't really matter. A lot of people say it, but I don't think it's necessarily true. I think in a lot of situations, language does matter a lot. So the question could be, yes, maybe this is the question we want to ask. So an expert would get that. An expert would understand that, for example, using Python would mean that we get less concurrency and less processing power. And we would, maybe we should use something else, like C Sharp or, or Golang. So basically, what I'm trying to convey here is that one of, two of the most um, interesting aspects of being competent in something is having the right focus and having no need to rely on rules or less of a need to rely on rules. That's the Dreyfus model, a really good way to measure yourself. So the benefits of knowing your level is, first of all, you're less frustrated when completing tasks. I have an intern that I'm working with for a half a year already, and, and she gets really frustrated because she doesn't it's really difficult for her to estimate 
um, what's what what she sh where she should be at, right? She, it's it's very scary, like to work in a big company and you just started out, and you don't know if you're supposed to complete it earlier, if you're doing good enough. It's really so basically knowing where you are is less frustrating in, in a really hard, uh, big margin. Um, next thing is just aligning expectations with your colleagues and uh, your employers and colleagues. Basically, like it, it would be a shame if you say you're a senior and then you go to a company and you're like, no, you're, you, you can't do anything. We got we to gotta cut your pay. So the other thing is personal fulfillment. You just feel like you, you're advancing in a pace that makes sense to you. Your career, your life is going the right way. And just allowing it to advance this way. Next thing is actually, it's not a strategy, but it has something to do with what we just talked about. It's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. So basically, it's, it also has a lot to do with the, what we talked about with the self-deception. So the Dunning-Kruger effect is a cognitive bias whereby people with low ability, expertise, or experience regarding a type of task or area of knowledge tend to overestimate their ability for knowledge. So this is a long sentence, um, but basically what it's trying to say is that when you have less skill, you're less able to estimate how skillful you are at something. So a lot of people who are juniors have this thing called, um, I think it's kind of offensive, but a lot of people call, call the peak mount stupid. <laughs> Whereas when you start out, you, you're the least capable of knowing just how incompetent you are. And then when you go, you, when you keep flowing with, with your career and gaining knowledge, you get this confidence gap. When you always feel like you're not as good as you should be because you, like Socrates, you know how stupid you are. Because you're a human, not because there's something wrong with you. Just that's who we are. I don't think that this applies to everyone, by the way. Some people uh, don't feel this way, but I think it's a really good tool to um, interact and think about life and learning and biases and self-deception. Next, um, let, how do you even choose what to learn? Because you, again, you have so much, uh, so many options, right? So what you can do um, is ask yourself, and I actually, I want to ask you guys, which group do you think is more consistently relevant? Remember that we talked about the half-life of a developer's knowledge? So, who says that the left group is more consistently relevant to your career? Raise your hand. The second group? Yeah, so everybody gets it. Everybody seems to get it. So, the second group... Um, is consists of very abstract and theoretical knowledge, and a, a lot of course. It's funny because all of you raised your hands, and a lot of courses and uh, even uh, colleges and universities these days market themselves as, are, as being very practical and teaching the relevant tools. But you guys sense the, have the right notion about this. Basically. Tools often have shorter, lines, shorter lifespans than theoretical concepts. Obviously, this exclu excludes Kubernetes. Kubernetes will, will be with us until uh, the 30th century. Um, but aside from that, tools are just, they have a shorter lifespan. They become relevant way more rapidly than theoretical concepts like design patterns and architectural design and all that. So. And, and the thing that's so great about it is when you learn these theoretical concepts behind the tools, you basically get a lot of knowledge into the tools, right? Because, for example, React is very much based on functional programming, which is a theoretical concept. It's a programming paradigm. It's based on unidirectional data flow. Um, C Sharp is OOP. It applies to Java, to C++, to a lot of languages. And it has static typing, which is also very, uh, it, it exists in a lot of languages, right? Um, and Docker has uh, this concept, this annoying concept of computer networks that obviously applies to a lot of things. And encapsulation, which is also in common with um, programming languages and other, actually a lot of things in life in general, right? So, um, so that's just a better way 
to, often it's better to learn a theoretical concept, even though it doesn't feel like it. I know it doesn't feel like it. I know it. I, wanna f I have this thing of focusing on tools. I have it, too. Maybe a lot of you do. Like, I, I've, I love thinking about languages. It's so colorful. And I love looking at the screen with my IntelliJ theme. Sorry, Visual Studio theme. I'm offending you guys. Um, with my writer theme. Uh, <laughs> uh, I love looking at it. It's, it's so beautiful. And I love thinking about the superficial because it's so e easy. But honestly, we have to be honest. Theory is the basis for all of this. So when you have the time, you should choose learning about the observer pattern rather than reactive programming. No, sorry. Rather than Arix or something like that, or if, if you're familiar with this tool. So when time marches on, um, the, the nice thing is that the programming principles just stay with us, right? A lot of imperative programming um, skills that were invented and first put to use in the 90s are still here in, in uh, 2023. So when you focus on the right principles and theory, it will just stay with you longer. That's, that's just how it is. And it, I think it's wonderful, right? Because you can even bring it home to other parts of life. You can do other, other kinds of engineering with it, for example. Next thing is a little more practical, and it has to do when you're all, you've already started learning, and it's called cognitive load, and I, I'm sure a lot of you feel it in your daily lives. Um, so basically, it wouldn't be right to say that our minds work like computers. I think it's an, underestim uh, it's an underestimation of how complex this organ is, the brain. But for the sake of this example, let's look at it as just a computer, because it's way beyond good enough to explain how it should how it should feel at least so when we ingest information it, it basically breaks down to three types i'm only going to talk about two which are intrinsic load intrinsic load is the relev is is load basically information that you ingest that you get in your system that you listen to that you read that you remember that you de derive from something that is relevant to the task at hand Basically, it's like the intrinsic nature of the, of, what, of the practice that you're trying to acquire. And then you have extraneous load, which does not contribute to learning at the task at hand. And that's exactly what you're seeing right now, right? This font doesn't contribute at all. <laughs> it doesn't, because it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty dark background and it's a dark font, so it doesn't contribute at all to your understanding of what I'm saying right now. So this is extraneous load. This is actually load that you're taking in that's actually making it difficult to ingest information. Sorry for testing you out live here on stage. <laughs> so let's, let's look at an example. This is Alex. I, I arbitrarily named these dogs. Um, this is Alex, and he's trying to learn something really complex. And he has this working memory in his head right now. He has all this... This, um, this information coming in, and let's say that he's, he's like a genius, he's like the Einstein, Einstein of dogs, and he's taking in information, it's all intrinsic load, he's just ingesting everything perfectly, which is obviously not the case in most of our lives, because we have, always have some extraneous load, but we can really see how it gets worse when Robert comes along and starts talking about Bitcoin. And then um, Alex's workload um, working memory, sorry, starts filling up with extraneous load. Because him blabbering about crypto doesn't contribute at all to, to Alex's learning. So this is just one example. But obviously, there are so many more. Um, like, for example, when you're looking, you're, you're like watching a video and you have, it's a, in very low quality, then it's making it really difficult to ingest information. Or maybe the font that you're... Um, um, trying to read doesn't fit, or maybe it's too small or something, it doesn't contribute at all. I hope you, s I, by the way, yeah, I think it's good. Um, so, um, a noisy environment. Um, I, I'm, I'm so guilty of this. I keep talking in the office, people hate me for it, but a lot of us do it. Um, I just, I, I lo love human interaction, what can I do about it? Um, so, a noisy environment can really be extremely slow. It makes sense, right? You're trying to focus, and then your senses detect irrelevant information. Um, Non-cohesive communication, when somebody talks like in a very, doesn't get to the point, or somebody doesn't really use the right words, or doesn't get the meaning of the words they're using, um, that's another example. 
Um, low familiarity with the language or, or accent, I think it's fine to say. Like, if you're not familiar with a language or even a, an accent, it could be a little bit, um, it, could, it could bother, it, I mean, it could um, interrupt your learning a little bit. It's, so it's, it could be extern extraneous load. And obvious, of course, like biological conditions, for example, if you haven't slept right, which I think all of us experience so often, especially if you're, I'm not a parent, but I see parents struggle with this. Like you're, you, you, you just don't get enough sleep and people expect the same of you. And it's so difficult, I imagine. I imagine it's so difficult. I, I mean, I had lack of, lack of sleep. It really ruins your day, right? Um, hunger could really affect you and any preoccupation for like, maybe you've had a really bad breakup. Maybe, uh, I don't know, you're thinking about, um, the climate crisis, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, so all these things could um, really affect how you learn, how you ingest information, and how you um, operate in general, right? And now I want to share with you my own learning scene story. It's like when I, it's, it's a story of mine when I tried to learn something, and I, to put it li uh, lightly, I didn't learn right at all. Like, you'll see what I'm talking about. So that's me. Um, back when, when about at the time when I'm uh, at the, of the story I'm gonna tell you, and I was working in a bank in Israel, um, and um, I was working. Uh, I, what I wanted to do is um, write a fun project, just do something, learn something. I was really uh, a really young developer, and it turns out that building a, a, an effing game engine is kind of hard. It's really hard. The game engines are one of the most um, complicated pieces of software you have out there. Um, especially when you have like half a year of experience, which is what, what I was back then. So I was a backend developer in a bank. This is the building I worked at. I don't know why I included this picture. It doesn't really help at all. Does it? <laughs> I'll remove it next time. Uh, <laughs> and I was working nine to six. And then I went back home and I tried to learn to build a game engine from YouTube videos. This is uh, a YouTube channel called the Cherno. It's 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 learning gold for who loves game whoever loves game engine. It's pure gold. It's amazing what this guy made. It's like hundreds of videos about how you make a game engine from scratch, how you use OpenGL and stuff. It's really really interesting. So I recommend his channel. Um, and. Basically, how my zone of proximal development back then looked kind of like this. So I was very familiar with Java and Spring, and I had some, uh, you know, junior type knowledge of software design and coding, like coding principles, like solid stuff and all that. So that was what I was competent of back then, as a kind of a junior. Um, and what I had to do is um, I thought that this is how my zone of proximal development looked. I thought that I could learn linear algebra, entity component system, C++, and OpenGL, and just bridge the gap and make a game engine. Turns out it's not that simple. So basically, I would say that my level with the skills I already acquired was around this, like around um, being be between a novice and, and a competent developer back then, probably more towards the novice, if I'm being honest. Um, and that's the optimistic required level I needed of the skills that I didn't have. And that's very optimistic, by the way, because game engines are really hard. That's what I needed in order to even attempt to build a game engine. So it probably looked a little more like, like, like actually putting these skills, learning these skills in, is not enough. You have to bridge the gap between your, um, your inner circle and the middle circle. But, but only after you completed bridging this gap can you move on to, to building a game engine. And honestly, OpenGL is probably out there, right? I put it before in the middle circle, but it's really complicated. You also have to know some linear algebra to even use the, the graphics pipeline in OpenGL, so that, at least from what I knew back then. Um, so, so, this is, so, so I, I bet you can see why this is like a bad, like this is sort of a scene of mine. I didn't take in consideration what I actually need to do. What I actually, how I, I really had to structure my learning in order to achieve what I wanted. Um, so I want to give you tips that I would have given myself back then of how you can organize things better and how you can um, make sure you learn better in general. So, so some tips for better learning, uh, in my opinion, and I, I actually researched those things a bit, so it's not only my opinion. 
Um, one, the first thing you do is you want to isolate. So you want to perhaps break your learning to phases. And the, for example, the first um, phase for me would be C++. Like I would start by learning this very complex language. And then phase two, OpenGL. Actually, uh, I, I should have changed this because OpenGL was, is too complex, right? Perhaps it should, it should have been linear algebra. So um, imagine it's linear algebra. And then I just go on and break it up to further phases that can help actually help assist me in my learning. Um, the, th the second thing that's really important is the concept of repetition. We all, in general, really need repetition in order to actually get something. And that's something we honestly kind of lack in today's education, education system, at least in uh, the university in Israel, I, I can say that. They tell you something and they expect that by telling you, you just get it. And this is just not how we work. Things are absorbed only when you constantly repeat them. So repetition here is needed. So after phase two, you would probably need a phase three that combines C++ and linear algebra. Sorry for that. Um, uh, so, and then phase four would be advanced C++. So we're not done that easily, right? It's really a lot to learn. In order to learn it properly, we have to play around with it a bit. I can't jump from just doing C++ once, thinking I know uh, 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 pointer arithmetic and all that, and just jump to, to building a game engine. It's just, it just wouldn't work. So repetition is really key in a lot of, in most learning, especially when it's complex. Third thing is compromise. So honestly, in a lot of cases, we don't even need to learn a lot of things. Like, for example, um, actually before the example, certain skills are just more difficult to acquire. Um, the best example here would be um, that for example, you want to deploy something on Kubernetes and you're not familiar, but you have played around with Docker a few times before. And you just, you just want to, what you care about learning is the system right now, is the system that you want to build. You want to maybe build a Twitter system from Michai's, um, you actually want to implement it. So learning Kubernetes is really, um, most of you know how hard it is, I bet. Um, so perhaps it's just better to stick with a simple Docker network. Um, just make the compromise. It's fine. Your life, your, your, you have to invest in your life too, right? We can't just spend our entire life learning. I was so tired, like when I told you about when I was, um, I was basically developing all day and then getting back home, being on the computer till 1 a.m. and finishing my day. That's not a way to live. I need to eat. I need to sleep. I need some. some uh, I, need, I need to have contact with people. It's, it's really ne never give up on those things that make your your human life good, right? I have, I'm reminding this to myself because I, I, do, I do this a lot to, me, to myself, <laughs> honestly. Um, so I, we're almost done, actually, very early, but it's cool. Like, why not? We have a party to go to. Um, so some key takeaways I want to share with you guys. So what I really want all of us to get from this talk is, first of all, embrace our volatile industry. That's where we work. That's, that's, that's the truth about it. And it's going to escalate too. Let's not fool ourselves and say that AI won't take our job. Maybe it will. Maybe, honestly, maybe it will. Let's just accept this fact. And you know what? We'll all, if it does, remember what I said right now. Let's all go skiing, right? <laughs> let's just all go skiing together instead. I think it would be good enough for life. Um, and, and maybe we'll work as a waiter somewhere. It's fine. Just embrace that it's volatile, embrace that it, things could change. Things have always been this way, right? It was never different for, for any human being in, the, in, in our history. That's my opinion, at least. It's fine if you disagree. Um, second thing is that the right intention leads to better practice. That's why I, I focus so much on the philosophical aspects of our lives and about learning. Um, so if you first organize what's important to you, you can really make some cool stuff happen in your life. So before you practice, think about what you even want. What do you want to learn? Why do you want to learn things? Is this the career you want? It's fine to change, by the way. Recognize our own fundamental, profound, and deep, and I know I say these words a lot, self-deception. That's our nature. That's our nature, and it's fine. We're human. That's how we're supposed to work. Keep repeating that because I honestly believe this is one of the most important things you, you can know about life. And 
it's worth our time to invest in strategic learning, actually thinking before we sit to do stuff. Honestly, it's not all about, always about learning too, right? When you work, when you just want something uh, done properly. Um, yeah, just you, you strategizing could really help to deal with our own uh, biases and limitations and all that. And cut yourself some slack in general. You know, we all have our weaknesses. We're very aware of them all the time, I know. <laughs> Believe me, I know. Cut yourself some slack about this. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to know every language. You don't have to know every way to deploy your stuff. You don't have, have to know every theoretical concept, too. It's fine. Cut yourself some slack. Learn things that interest you. Don't just learn for the sake of learning, because you won't, I don't believe you'd get anywhere with this. And thanks. It was, I, it, it was a really fun talk for me. I honestly really enjoyed being here. Um, this conference is great in general. I'm really glad to see so many people at this hour. I honestly expected the, the place would be really empty by now. So really thank you for coming. The, the QR code is for the presentation. You can visit my GitHub. I have some, I, mean, I don't know what you would do there, but uh, we, I have some interesting projects that you can check out. Um, and you're always welcome to send me an email, chat about anything, share how your day went. That's fine with me. And we have a lot of time for questions. Anyone who, who wants to go get ready for the party, I won't be offended if you just get up and leave. Um, and if you have any questions, or actually not only questions, if you want to share anything or you want to comment on what I said, just go ahead. So thank you all for being here.